What is happening, everybody? Welcome. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. And on today's episode, we are tackling the subject, the assertion that martial arts is a constant experiment. Ooh, could could get spicy in here. <clears throat> Probably not. We'll get, we'll get spicy, not. but we'll have some good conversation. If you're listening, you can hear Andrew's voice. Andrew Adams, welcome, Andrew. How are you? I'm great. A little chilly in my basement this morning, but uh, I'm doing good. I'm glad you're here. And because we were recording a different episode and he didn't leave, Victor Carino's back. <laughs> okay, well, that just makes it sound bad. Um, you should say that this was the only episode where you didn't need someone who wasn't me. <laughs> He's not. He, I mean, sort of. But I, really. I I love that we're at a point where we can where we can joke like this yeah. because I would do it anyway, and I just I'm right. I'm just glad that I know you're not offended. You're, yes, it's, yeah, it's, that's, it's far more enjoyable. No, no hurt feelings. Thank you for being here. This will be fun. We don't often get to do three people on a Thursday episode. If you are new to what we do, that is the strangest introduction to what we do you might have ever imagined. However. If you go to whistlekick.com, you can check out all the things that we're working on along the way to our mission of getting everybody in the world to train martial arts for at least six months. What do we do? We connect, educate, and entertain. We work very hard for the traditional martial arts community. We are traditional martial artists, and we produce a variety of events, products, and services to serve, enhance, protect, etc. all of you out there. So if you go to whistlekick.com, you might find something in the store you want to grab. Use the code PODCAST15, saves you 15%. Now, Martial Arts Radio. Nearly 800 episodes at the time of this recording, and you can check out every single one of them for free. Audio versions, newer episodes, video as well, and since day one, transcripts. If you want to search something, you want to copy and paste something into your Kindle or iPad to read it later, that's all available for you for free if you're thinking you know what was I, there was somebody and I, I can't remember the episode i wanted to share it with someone and they said this thing well you can search that there's a search box whistlekick martial arts radio.com okay now other things that you could do to help us out besides buying and telling people what we do we've got a patreon p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com slash whistlekick thank you andrew starts at two bucks a month two bucks is going to tell you who's coming up on the show $5 gets you bonus content. $10 gets you bonus video content. $25 a month gets you every book we ever make and training programs and other stuff. And in the, the top tiers, you get access to our school owners mastermind, or this is your choice. I will teach you privately for no additional cost. So consider doing that. Head on over to patreon.com slash whistlekick. And if you want the whole list, the whole shebang, everything you can do to support us in our mission, it's the family page, whistlekick.com slash family. If you're family, you should be checking that out weekly because that's how often I update it. Gentlemen, this could be one of the nerdiest episodes we've embarked on, and that excites me. <laughs> uh, Victor, I know your propensity for nerdiness. Andrew, I've spent more than enough time with you to know your nerdiness on a firsthand, very direct basis. Yeah, yeah, small, mm, sure. <laughs> uh, and uh, anybody who knows what my last career was, literally computer company. Big nerdiness. <laughs> I mean, I, I took nerd and made a career out of it. Okay, uh, But the, the assertion here is that martial arts is a constant experiment. And we kind of came at this topic with a few different titles, a few different angles. And originally we were thinking about it in terms of sparring. But then as we kicked it around a bit, realized it's everything. And you, there, there are, there may be some folks out there and I don't think we have too many of these folks anymore, but we may have some folks in the audience saying, yeah, but, but Jeremy, you don't have to experiment anymore. Your instructor tells you what to do. They give you the form and you should, <laughs> Victor just rolled his eyes so hard. <laughs> Be careful they're gonna get stuck and you just you just do what you've been given and you're good to go like we've been doing this long enough you don't have to experiment anymore and victor as the eye roller i'm throwing it to you first yeah. what, what do you what, talk man what do you got ah uh, i mean it's just 
I think I think especially in modern martial arts, we have I I we have moved past the just carbon copy your instructor all the time. Whatever he says, don't question anything. One, that's a dangerous mindset, but that's another topic. Two, I mean, everybody, not everybody, every body is different. Um, I mean, I had the the privilege and the blessing of 20 over 20 years ago when I started training in my style, which my instructor founded, um, it was new and I hopped around in a couple of different places. We trained in a church multi-purpose room that had like mm. that thin layer of rug right over on uh, the concrete concrete. Yeah. And, and part of our art is jujitsu and throwing. So you can imagine the fun of that. And then we trained with full mats. We've trained in parks when we didn't have places and stuff. And so I got to be a part of watching my instructor constantly. Well, how does this work? How does this work? Well, I have so we had this one instructor, Mr. Mr. Beckett, who he was just like a muscle. Like he was an oak tree. I mean, you would you would try to throw him and he just he just wouldn't move. But my instructor could throw him. So his his style was con our style, I should say, was constantly evolving before my eyes that I didn't even know was a white belt because I remember how we used to do things. And then I go back and I see how he's teaching the white belts now. And I ask him, that's not how you taught me. And he goes, yeah, well, I realized throwing you guys around that this way doesn't always work. Mm -hmm. So if I teach them this way, then it's easier for them to adapt it to someone like me who's flexible or someone like this other guy who doesn't bend at all. So you're talking about the experimentation that would come from any evolutionary process. If a right. martial art is going to get, quote, better, there is some experimentation that's going to go along with that. It makes absolute sense. Andrew. Yeah. You've you've been around. You've done a bunch of different stuff in a bunch of different schools. Where do you see experimentation happening? So... Before I get there, I'll, I will quickly say that the, and, and I'm predominantly a karate practitioner, mm -hmm. but all of those m past founders of their styles, they never meant for it to be preserved in amber. And that that's a quote that I that I take from <gasps> he, Ian uses that quote a lot, preserved in <gasps> amber, and it's just encased and should be exactly like that. Like, th there's always been... Uh, experimentation stuff always changes. And so, I mean, if you go back and you read Funakoshi's own writing, where yeah. he says, "Don't codify," and, yep. and I'm, I'm I'm not using it, the direct quotes, but "Don't codify what I've put down. It needs to continue to evolve." You yeah, mean that exactly. happened? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, okay. And and so, the experimentation that that you know when we first started talking about this, my initial thought was in sparring, yeah. like. You know, uh, you and I are going to square off against each other and have a consensual fight. Uh, and we're going to feel each other out. And I'm going to try some things. And you know what? Those things work really well on when I'm fighting this person over here. But now you and I get together and it's very different. And so I've got to try new things. And the things I used to use don't work. And, you know, there's a lot of experimentation there. And so sparring my... is probably the clearest example. Yeah. Of where that experimentation is. Please and so it. that's where my head initially went. But in talking about it more, it's so much bigger than that. Hmm. Where else do you see experimentation, if not only in sparring? Uh, forms. Okay. You know, uh, I'm, you know, a perfect example. The school that I currently train at does not go to any, has never as a school gone to any competitions ever. Mm -hmm. And last year, my instructor brought forth, hey, there's this tournament that, you know, my, if, uh, this is him talking, he's like, my instructor's instructor is, is former instructor is holding a tournament. If people would like to go, you know, he would, he would uh, approve of that. And uh, I went and it, it was involved a lot of me practicing my form different ways, ways mm -hmm. that 
want to showcase this particular move as being more emphasis on this move than on these other moves. And, you know, this coming year, it's happening again in May, and there will be a few students going. And so there will be discussions on when we perform our forms, they should not necessarily always be move one, move two, move three, move four, move five, move six, move seven, move eight, move nine, move 10. You know, there's, we're going to play around with it a little bit and find a way that works. There's going to be some experimentation in there. Anytime you have trial and error or this or that, A or B, let me see what this looks like here. That's an experiment. Maybe it's not a scientific experiment. Maybe you're not controlling for all variables, but there's still an element of that. And, and one of the early versions of the title of this was you know, kind of around science and this, this recognition that, especially if we look at combat, there's an evolution that happens and it doesn't take much time. Anybody out there who's been a big fan of MMA from the early days knows that there have been eras in the UFC where, you know, if you were very skilled in this element of combat, you tended to do better. And so everyone started to get better at that. But then other people, you know, that because if my hand's out, something's open, right? Like we, we know that from our training. So there's always something for somebody else to get better at. And so you end up with these, you know, grappling era, striking era, wrestling era, whatever in various MMA uh, promotions. So when, when you think about how you experiment with your training, Victor, and I, and I know that you, you you've run schools and I know that you are a thoughtful person, so I imagine that you spend a fair amount of time going, hmm, in the context of martial arts. You know, what does that look like for you? Yeah, so it's it's. I think I said this in the, the, the episode that I was on that you interviewed me, is that I know a lot of people who do martial artists, but there's a difference between someone who is a martial artist and someone who does martial arts. I think everyone mm -hmm. should do it, but the person who is a martial artist is like myself, Everything that I think about is through the lens and the concept of martial arts, 100%. Like to the point where I have a hard time with my friends and family who don't train in martial arts. And I'm trying to give an analogy and it's a martial arts analogy and they have no idea what I'm talking about. So then I have to explain my and, analogy. And it makes so much sense. If, if, if you guys had just right. trained for a little bit, you right. would totally get what I'm saying right now. Yeah. So so back to back to my instructor and how we would experiment with with our art. He was the, the founder of the system at the time that I started. I think he was a seventh, but, you know, he's a 10th degree master who still spars his white belts. And a lot of people don't. A lot of people have a hard time doing that. But by the time they're black belts like me, he knows all of our tricks and he can still keep, keep up with us. Why? Because he's been keeping up with us the whole time. That part of experimentation is really good. I kind of would push back a little bit in just the statement that you said about it's not scientific, maybe, but it is. I mean, every every type of experimentation is scientific. Uh, when I came to free the not the the seminar that you did in mm. Philly with my cousin, he's a brown belt in our system, and he's one of those people that sees music as math, that math is mm. music. Like mm -hmm. that's how the depth of his nerdiness goes. He's so much. More, I have to rein his scientificness in when we talk because I don't understand the stuff that he's going into. So he's very much like, well, what if this happens? And what if this happens? And so when him and I talk, Andrew, you talked about forms. I remember this one time um, that I called him one day because our style doesn't have a lot of forms because it's just something that my instructor needed in order to get certified. So he took Chuck Norris's forms and adapted them to ours because he had the book. And technically one of his schools was part of that system and style. So we don't have, and we have no weapons forms because weapons are like every so often for eight weeks, my instructor will hand a sign and we'll just fight each other with them and figure figure out what to do. Like that's how our weapons program used to be. That's very experimental. Very experiment, very experimental. And so I was like, why don't we have forms for this? I was like, what if we would do, what if I, what if I took Basai and I did it with a Wakazashi? And I started doing it and I came up with something, but like all good science, 
it needs peer review. So what did I do is I got my phone, I set up a camera, I set up a camera and I video called my cousin Mm. at like nine o'clock at night. And we then were on the phone for three hours. He was in his living room. He got, he didn't have a wakazashi. So he got a stick and a shorter stick, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm in my living room. He's in my living room. I show him what I got. He goes, well, what if you did this? Why? Because peer review, just like, I mean, we think of peer review when it comes to sparring. I got plenty of examples when it comes to that. But peer review, when it comes to working on something, even there's um, there's a there's a form specific to my system called Shunote Niote that is made up. And then there's another, we have our version of Kanku, which is one of our black belt kata, which my instructor made up. And I like Kanku a lot. I like his changes and his tweaks to it. It took him two days to make all the tweaks that he wanted. With Shuna Teneote, he let his right-hand man and two of his high-ranking black belts take part in developing that kata. Mm. Took him six months. I think that Shuno Teniote is the far superior and complex. I mean, you can watch that kata. If all you did, and Andrew, you've seen it because I did it a bunch of times in that form group that we did, that kata, the the essence of the style of Segido Ru is in that form and mm-hmm. movement and everything. Why? Because it's peer reviewed. It, it, and, and I think it's better because of that. Mm. Right on. You know... I, I do want to clarify. I agree. There is a scientific element. What I meant was to say that I'm not aware of anyone taking rigorous scientific method into martial arts. They're not doing, you know, controlled experiments, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, sometimes we will, but we all have good days and bad days. And, you know, I don't, I don't think anyone's suggesting that, um, we have full control over the number of variables yeah. for example right like it's yeah. which is kind of something that you would need so where else might experimentation show up andrew like you know beyond forms yeah. beyond sparring where would we see it so in our uh in our school we when you are testing for any udansha rank uh, Which is any, what any any rank above black belt, black belt and above are are, are considered yudancha. Uh, you know we have the forms that we have to do, and we have bunkai or applications from those forms. And as you're going up in the under ranks, these are the bunkai that we expect you to know. Like the move in the form is this, and this is the application that we we're not saying this is the only one. This is the one that we choose to teach to our mm-hmm. students. But once you get to black belt, testing for black belt or higher, you are expected to understand and perhaps change a little bit on your own the bunkai that is the, quote, official one for our school. But if you want to tweak it a little bit to add on something that maybe you see the form doing or going in a different direction, you are allowed and in a lot of ways expected to Mm -hmm. do that. How do you do that? Well, you experiment. You try. You fit. You try it. You you grab the person. I would grab the the uke that I'm working with, the partner, and I say, okay, so this is what the bunkai is, the official bunkai is. But you know what? What if I did this and and you play around with it? Well, what is that? That's experimentation. And where's yeah. I, I I understand, but you know, let's let's make sure everyone does. What's the value there? Well, the value there is looking at the movements within a form, how they could be utilized, and the principle of that movement, how could it be used in an actual application? Hmm. Victor, I see you nodding your head. Is there something you want to add? Yeah, I mean, it's it's so funny. So recently, I've been cross-training um, in uh, Kung Fu, in the uh, the style Bagua Zhang, which is one of the three main internal arts. There's Xingyi, Tai Chi, Bagua. Mm-hmm. Bagua is the, the baby brother of it, as my, my Sifu calls it. And there's these things called palm changes, which are forms, each one's forms, and they are generally in sets of eight. So there's the eight 
animal palm changes. There's the eight double animal palm changes. There's the eight dragon palms, the heaven palms, the earth palms. It's, it's Chinese art, so everything sounds very pretty um, in both the original language and in English, like scooping moon low, where, you know, in the, the English translation, if it was Japanese, would just be like bend and strike. But one of the things is, is that generally with Bagua, the way my instructor teaches it, because I ask him, like, at what point, like, I have a high rank, as much as I don't like to talk about it, so it makes me uncomfortable, in my style. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, what, he, he asked me during our first conversation, what do you want from me? It's a weird question. And I was like, I just want whatever you're going to teach. And he goes, well, I'm not going to start you on basics. You, what are basics? He told me he generally most of the people he takes already have at least a black belt or higher in some other form of traditional martial arts. And he teaches me the palm changes and some of them he'll be like, here's an application. But a lot of them, he says, this move is just to get you in close and then you have stuff to do, do it. And I'm like, I'm sorry, what? Cause you have stuff to do, do it. I don't need to tell you what, what you should hit, how you should hit whatever. And then uh, there's this whole other set that I'm working on that, because he knows that Karen's with me and I get to have a training partner. And he goes, have her throw punches at you and come up with applications. And then he said the weirdest thing I've ever had an instructor tell me. He goes, because you might find a different thing that I might steal from you because I've never thought about it that way. The admittance of his Bagua is constantly evolving because he's taking in students from other arts and basically... I mean, I went to a seminar that he did where um, he did San Shin Show. And it was it was a form he learned from my instructor's instructor. So it was I was like, oh, I know this version of San Shin Show. It was nothing like the San Shin Show that I knew because he took it and he made it mm. so much softer than it was supposed to be to fit his art. But he only did that because he. He experimented with it and he's mm. constantly taking on students who move differently, who know differently, who do different things. And he's not rigid in saying, this is the way that I want you to do this. Do it this way. Mm. So here's a question. If we're going to make the statement that martial arts is a constant experiment, can we also make the statement that more experimentation or, or I guess we could call it better experimentation because one could experiment in a poor fashion but better experimentation leads to better martial arts. If you are a better experimenter, are you a better martial artist? Andrew? Hmm. I think the case could be made for that. Um, and I, and I think the other thing that was going through my, I'm going to backtrack a little bit. You know, sure. one of the things you talked about earlier is that, you know, not, not questioning your instructor. And I, and I think that that's a, important, but I also think when you're a super beginner, there's some, there's something to be said for just, Sure. Just learning what you're doing, which absolutely. is why, which is why uh, that experimentation that I talked about with the applications of forms that happens at black belt and above, right? Um, but I, I, I get what you're saying, and I could, I could make a case for it either way. I kind of, I'm, I'm torn as to drawing a hard line on that. I think there's a limit. Yeah. Let's see, Victor. What do you think? Well, to go back to your scientific thing, I'm just thinking about this. Um, I've read a lot of really good um, scientific papers mm -hmm. and really bad scientific papers. Mm. And I found a delineation when the person who's writing the paper, doing the experiment, enters in saying, I'm going to prove that this is true. It's generally a bad paper because they do not exhaust as soon as they get the result they want, they stop. Right. They stop the experimentation. The best papers that I've read that have put to practice a scientific method have been the ones that said, I'm curious as to what happens under these conditions. That they're, and they're they open drill. to either way. Yeah. And they drill and they drill and they drill and they drill. And then they'll say, you know, we got this complete opposite result, but these are outliers because seven out of 10 times, this is the case, but we can't not even mention these other three times because that's still valid data. So I think that you can, you can experiment and not become a good martial artist, but in, in, in two ways, 
in two ways. One, experimentation too soon. Mm -hmm. After eight years, I got my black belt. My instructor tied it around my waist and said, now you're my student. Mm -hmm. After eight years. On the other side of that, I now understand because I didn't know enough to know, as we all know, we don't know enough to know the things to question, right? So you could experiment too soon. And I think we see a lot of that as martial martial arts are now popular. Well, I know how to throw a punch and a kick. That's all I need from this person. Now I'm going to go over to this person and get this. Okay, I know how to get out of this lock. That's all I need from this person. Now I'm going to go over. And you you just, you never drill the same thing over and over. Or I could see if you just live in your own little secluded bubble and say, well, I can defend myself from this punch. How many different ways? I mean, I've been in how many different schools or even Jeremy, when I went to the seminar that you did with all those different people, I don't think anyone, my cousin included, who trains in the same style or at least did as me, threw a lunge punch the exact same way. So just exposing yourself beyond your bubble is I think another prerequisite another necessity to good experimentation because there's bad experimentation that then i think would lead to be not lead to but keep you from becoming a good martial artist if we unpack what experimentation is you know there i think there are two critical elements as it enters this conversation the first is having enough of a foundational understanding of the thing that you were experimenting on or with that you can see what the outcome is if you don't know what you're doing with the technique or the form or sparring or whatever it is if you're if you are experimenting let's call it too early your results become very murky you know if i'm going to if i participated in an experiment involving quantum physics i can use the words i can read the results um, I can run the simulations, probably even do some of the programming, but I don't have enough of an understanding of the science mm-hmm. to fully know what's going on. And thus, my participation in that experiment would be uh, kind of wasted, even if I'm not running the experiment, right? Like, I'm not going to fully grasp the outcome and be able to internalize that. Okay. Uh, that's number one. And then number two, is being able to really understand what that outcome is. You know, if if you brought up the example, Andrew, you know, you spar with somebody else, then you spar with me. If I'm sparring with you and you kick me in the face, what does that mean? Now, obviously, something didn't go the way I'd intended, but was it my attention? Was it my guard? Was it my stance? Was it that I was so hyper-focused on doing this that you took advantage, right? There are a lot of possibilities there. And the ability to understand what's going on is kind of critical. And that leads me to uh, something that I'm going to suspect we all do, maybe without realizing it. And that is that we are generally experimenting on a small number of things at one time. Maybe it's one. If I step in and I'm sparring with someone, I'm probably thinking about, here's what I'm thinking about today. My priority today is on this or that. If I'm working on one of my forms, I'm thinking about one particular section or one particular technique. I'm not getting overwhelmed by experimenting on everything because the human mind really can't process information in that way. We're really good at doing one thing at a time. We're not so great at working on seven or eight things at a time. I'm not sure if either of you have a response. Well, I mean, I I would say it also, def- I mean, what is a scientific experiment, right? It is having a control and a baseline of something, changing a single variable and looking at the result and may- changing it in a different way and looking at the result. If you have a baseline and you change 12 things, you 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 have no idea which of those 12 things created the different result so when you're sparring you can't all of a sudden change 12 things like if you're sparring and something doesn't work you have to change one maybe two things about what you're doing 
to determine what is it that that gave you the result you were looking for. Well, Andrew, you said when. Go ahead. When I, when I, sorry, when I, when when I was was talking about um, my thing before is to, to to be open to to any result, but that's that's the thing is is that you need to at least expect a result. Yeah. If you're experimenting and changing everything, that's just chaos. That's this. There's nothing to observe there. If you're changing, you need to you need to be looking for a, a result. And Jeremy, you said it. We can't process information like that much at one time. So we have to control the amount that we change in order to do anything. And that's, I mean, you see it online when people say to martial artists who aren't martial artists, "Well, that would never work on the street." But what they don't understand is the dojo, dojang, training hall, whatever. That is an experiment lab. That is a scientific mm. lab. Mm. We are pulling out. I can't remember who I heard say this, but when I throw my punch and hold it here, we all understand that this is not held here, right? This is a microsecond in time that we are removing and pausing so that we can now observe all of the openings because we can't, no one perceives things that fast. Naturally, we have to train it. So we are taking these little microcosm seconds and pauses in these moments in time and dissecting them so that in the quote unquote street, something comes out of us because our body by rote muscle memory remembers those moments in time mm. that we trained over and over and over again. The training hall itself is the lab. I That's really like doing. that that metaphor of, of where we train being in a lab being a laboratory and i i suspect if we you know that that would i don't have have a school of my own currently but i i i wonder if those of you out there who do what if you had laboratory night you know don't call it lab night because people will show up with their dogs but if you had <laughs> laboratory night and actually if they do show up with the dogs you better invite me dog night at the dojo dojo dog that's well, not style agnostic, but there we go. Anyway, um, if we if we set that expectation on certain days, what if there's laboratory night where everything is up for discussion? You know, you probably want to limit that to higher ranks. But what if it is? What if there was one night where there was no stupid question? And in fact, you encourage people to ask questions of the most fundamental things. Well, why do we have our stance like this? Like this some really interesting stuff could come out of it because if you if you think back, you know, um, philosophy is a subject that isn't often considered scientific. But if you start to get into the philosophy of science or the science of philosophy, which, you know, tend to go one direction more than the other. Victor, you brought up the way most research papers are done. They're trying to prove their point. Well, what if we try to disprove what we do? Okay, so, you know, uh, front stance is a fairly standard thing, you know, in terms of weight distribution and length among the martial arts styles that I've trained in anyway. What if we try to break that? What if, what if, what if there was a better way to uh, travel forward while remaining defensive and offensive with a lot of versatility and the ability to use these techniques? Can we do that? And you throw stuff against the wall and you see what sticks. And I suspect that at those very fundamental levels, no, you won't come up with anything except a much greater understanding and probably some detail that your newer upper ranks might have some epiphanies going off. Mm -hmm. And I suspect everybody periodically would. Uh, actually, this idea excites me enough that if I had a school, we would be doing this tonight. Oh, I'm... I, I I wrote it down. I'm I saw you write that down. I'm, yeah. I'm still well. It's it's funny you said the thing about philosophy. So a while ago on my podcast, my cousin and I had a conversation on Stephen Hawking's A Brief History of Time. Mm. Uh, just a light conversation. Yeah, on a yeah. Brief you know, just ca <laughs> casual you know, as you do. But one of my favorite sections was actually in the wrap up, where Hawking is talking about how science has continuously gotten better, and basically. A year after someone graduates with a doctorate in their science, in their very specific scientific field, if they don't continue their education after school, everything that they know yeah. is old news. Yeah. 
one of the things that he said in that was in the ancient days, the field of science was so small that it was, and I quote, thought to be the job of the philosophers and the seers at the time. Hmm. And he almost speaks of it as he's lamenting that there aren't more philosophers within the scientific community because they're the ones who there is no stupid question. I've talked to a lot of scientists who's been like, well, that's a dumb question. Obviously, the universe works like this. Well, what if it doesn't? There's a whole chapter in A Brief History of Time where he was like, I understand that this is how we understand, like, like that this is how we know things to work. But let's assume this to be true. What is the universe? That's a great place to start in any conversation. Mm -hmm. What if this was true, right? Isn't that how we talk about self-defense? But what if there's one person? What if there's two person? What if I have someone with me who knows nothing about martial arts and I can't just jump out of the way and let them get hit? by the baseball bat that's being swung at me, right? Mm. I think we it's great to be philosophical. That's the, that's, see, I'm such, I'm a nerd, but I am such a martial arts nerd. Everything will be about martial arts. I will talk for hours about it. And like, I went to the zoo and was talking, <laughs> talking to Karen about, you know, well, that's actually a really good martial principle what those what those wild African dogs are doing right there because and, sh and she's a martial artist too so she gets it she puts up with me but like that's to say like you see it everywhere but then you're like be because of that I, I had this this conversation and I haven't had a chance to because I don't have a school with more than just her and I right now and my buddy doesn't who trains too because he moves around with his wife who's in the military and I'm like it would be really fun if we did team sparring like like we've done one with three opponents, but what if it was like, okay, it's you two versus the, these four or these three, and Absolutely. we'll start really slow. That's an experiment I want to run. And I've yet to have the opportunity to do it, but I'm really excited and I'll film it when we do for posterity. I, I, I've sake. done that. We can, we can talk about it. Oh, oh yeah. I, I, yeah. I can't wait. I think it's, I think it, it's so interesting. Like my brain is already on 20 different tangents about what would happen if this happened. What about this? What about this? What about this? Yep. Andrew. Yes. I, I think, I think we're, we're reaching the end. Is there, is there anything that we haven't put on the table for folks to consider? Uh, I don't, I don't think so. I think I would be surprised if people listening, if people started listening to this episode and started thinking, what are you guys talking about? Martial arts isn't a science experiment. I'd be surprised if they didn't see it differently now. Because mm. when you really break it down and look at what it is we're doing, it's it's fairly obvious. It can be, if you're looking for it, for sure. But if, you, if you've if you listened to this episode, yeah. I think you would see oh, that it's fairly obvious. Fully agree. Fully agree. And and of course, as always, we invite people who, who disagree to respond and let us know. Absolutely. In a respectful way, because we always value that discussion. Uh, Victor, how about you? Did we leave anything out that we should shoehorn no, in? Before we I, I, I think I think that we touched a lot of things. And it, it, again, the philosophical part, I just hope that if those who did enter this episode had that thought of, of martial arts is physical, science is science, is that they, they, they look at it differently now. Because mm. if you look at it differently, you'll be better. Absolutely agree. And I do want to thank everyone for checking this out, for watching, for listening, maybe reading, whatever it is, however you consume this episode. Thank you. I want to thank Andrew. I want to thank Victor for coming on for your time. And to all of you out there, if you want to support us, if you want to help us continue to connect, educate, and entertain, hopefully you found a bit of all three in this episode. Well, you got lots of things you can do. Leave a review, buy us something, tell us somebody come do a thing, join the Patreon, whatever it is. Our social media is at Whistlekick. You can sign up for a newsletter on any of our websites. And if you've got a school, maybe you want to have me come out and teach a seminar. Maybe you want to hire us as your consulting firm to help you grow and make more money and reach more students and do all the things that you love to do. And if nothing else, I do appreciate your time. Shout out to everybody who supports us, those Patreon contributors and all the rest of you doing cool stuff to help us do what we do, including you two gentlemen here. 
Until next time, train hard, train hard smile, 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 have, a, and great have a great day. day. Oh, all that was so cringy. <laughs>